I don't really know how to start shows. Come on now, don't start, don't start liking me now. So yeah, I'm funny compared to, you know, well you'll see later. I stand for mayhem! I know a lot of fucking idiots. I think a lot of shit is mean-spirited just because it goes against what they believe. But the relief of comedy is it takes things that aren't funny and it allows us to laugh about them for an hour. We got a purple suit to buy and a gigantic <laughs> coffin. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing? A History of Comedy podcast. Not in the vaulted podcast studios today, but in uh, the extremely uncomfortable bright lights of Craigland. Uh, we are today. I'm pleased to introduce you to the late night wars involving David Letterman and Jay Leno and. Uh, my very special guest this week from the At A Theater Near Me podcast. Uh, you may know him as Chris Clemmer. How are you, sir? Good. This is a much cleaner. I never thought Craig, Craig Land would be so clean. It's very strange. It's, it's uncomfortable. Here. It's like a big, it's a fancy business building. Oh. It's not, it's uncomfortable, quite frankly. I, not, fit, I fit right in. Not oh, that, at all. Yeah, so that's the nice thing is we can't see Craig, although he is. My fear today is that uh, me and Matt kind of have a chemistry. Like, I enjoy doing the show with Matt. He he knows when I'm zigging and zagging, whereas Craig almost purposely gets in the way at times. So it'll be interesting to see how we <laughs> go here. Also, Craig can't read and I can't type. So the notes may yeah. be a disaster today. It's but be bad. I think... Uh, I think you're explaining the magic of the blind mic project. I think, <laughs> I think both Chris and I know the subject well enough that hopefully we don't get too lost today because uh, it's one of the most... Uh, probably one of the biggest storylines in, I mean, certainly talk show history, but maybe even comedy history, to where it essentially has a child. Like, the Leno Letterman thing and the Leno Conan thing is almost so similar that it seems scripted. Yeah, and at times, uh, just kind of rehashing for this show, I was doing reading some of the book excerpts and watching the movie and seeing some of the stuff, and I was like, oh my God, some of the same things that Letterman was upset that NBC was pulling were exactly the same things that NBC would pull on Conan. Literally, to a point where we have a clip today where that Letterman literally addresses during the Conan thing as well. It's very weird. Um, but first of all, Chris, for the folks at home, tell you know, for the people that don't know, tell us what a theater near me is. Yes, I go to the movie theaters every single day for an entire year. Oh uh, my God, what a wacky endeavor. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Very wacky. No. Uh, you've, been, you've been on the program. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic. I recommend everyone goes listen to it. Yes, please go listen to it. If you're near me, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, you can check out the podcast anywhere that you hear this. Hopefully, and uh, and you can follow my adventure, if you will. Since my uh, since we're talking talk shows today, I pretty much mentioned Norm Macdonald Live every week, the greatest talk show that ever existed, and one of my favorite running things that he did, like uh, when he had uh, Super Dave Osborne on Bob Einstein, the first episode. Every time Bob would go into a story, like he'd be talking about Kirby enthusiasm, and Norm would go, tell the folks at home who Larry David is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I, you know, we'll, we'll be bouncing around the timeline and everything a little bit because it gets a little uh, confusing at times. But I guess the best place to start is probably uh, 1991 when uh, Johnny Carson unexpectedly retires um, the movie kind of portrays it as like when he comes out, everyone's like, what are we going to do? Yeah. Although it was like in the works, people in the business have been talking about how Carson, his audience had gotten old. Uh, you know, Arsenio is kind of taking over the younger audience. Um, and they've been preparing for this stuff for years. But, um, if you guys don't know at the NBC upfronts in 1991, that's basically the big, uh, you know, convention where they announce all their fall programming and everything. Uh, their special guest was Johnny Carson, and he came out and uh, uh, unexpectedly, he just kind of, it was weird how he casually threw in, hey, as we know, this is my last year. Like, I guess he was doing that to stick it to NBC or something, but he very, like, a couple times mentioned it almost so that people weren't even quite sure that he was actually retiring. Yeah, I think it was weird for Johnny to be that, I mean, it's, yeah, personal, Um Obviously retiring, it's a public show, but Johnny didn't talk about his public life a ton. I mean, he did go through a lot of divorces and he'd make jokes he about that those, yeah. on the Tonight Show and stuff. But, you know, him leaving this show and, and, and as we know from what happened, Johnny wasn't just leaving this show. He was really leaving show business. He was leaving everything. Yeah. Because um, he really didn't make much of a return at all. He intentionally went very private. Yeah, he was a recluse. He pretty much he appeared on Letterman like two or three times, maybe. Yeah, one time he didn't even say a word. Very, yeah, he walked out and walked out. <laughs> yeah. Walked in and walked out. Uh, so, Johnny, do you think Johnny Johnny was done? I think also Johnny wasn't super thrilled with how NBC was was treating him with some stuff. Now, yeah. if you go way back, you know there were rumors that Joan Rivers is going to take over for him. There were rumors even in the seventies that it, uh, 
a guy named John Davidson would take over. There were all these rumors for a long time that he was going to be, you know, he was going to walk away eventually. Um, so I think Johnny's wanted to do his way. It was, it was a little bit of a fuck you, WC. Yeah, and it, there was also a little bit of, so I guess, I'm very curious, and maybe you've got a better perspective on this. I think the whole five-minute thing is very strange to me in television, where, so if you don't know, the uh, Tonight Show starts at 11.35, and that wasn't always the case. Originally, the Tonight Show was an hour and a half. Then it was an hour and 15 minutes. And then it got pushed down to an hour. And then because of a lot of, I mean, like, I could get into the specific details, but I'm not even sure I understand them. But basically, it was like the affiliates wanted to keep uh, news on for longer, different things. Yeah. Essentially, they were trying to push the Tonight Show back five minutes. Yeah. And Carson took that basically as a fuck you to him. And that's a level of confidence that amazes me because I'd be like, yeah, do whatever. Make it 20 minutes. I don't care. But I like the idea that Carson's like, it's a minor thing, but that was kind of the last straw where he's like, fuck you. I've been number one for 30 years. You're not going to take five more minutes away from me. Yeah, the affiliates really wanted to get more of that ad time. The local news, the 11 o'clock local news, it's not necessarily 100% the case anymore. But back then, that was the biggest money generator, revenue generator for any affiliate. A local news, right. you know, having that 11 o'clock news, that's when people watch back then, you know, it's pre, pre-internet, pre a lot of the cable stuff we have now. Um, people watched it a lot. And that's where you had to have five minutes extra where you could sell advertising. You know, even like a minute more of advertising was a huge win for the affiliates. They really pushed hard on the networks to do it. NBC finally caved. And like I said, I think that was the last drop for Johnny. Yeah. So he came out at the uh, upfronts and said that. And then he came out on Letterman that night. It was literally like... I think less than a couple hours after he was at the NBC upfronts, he walked right over to Letterman. Um, Letterman knew he was coming out and had like an idea of what he had said at the upfronts, but didn't exactly know how it was going to go. Johnny came out with a big check like Ed McMahon. Uh, It was funny. And uh, Johnny basically just, again, kind of casually referenced like, uh, yeah, this is our last year. We're pretty much done after this year and then moved on. Like he said, I want to be a shepherd or something like that. And that was it. Like there was no, it was strange for how much uh, he, I guess that it is going out on his terms where he he didn't want a lot of fanfare yet wanted it to be his way very specifically. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Johnny wasn't in New York a ton. Um, You know, obviously they shot all this stuff in Burbank. I mean, the Tonight Show started in New York, but then I think in 70, early 70s, they ended up going to, to California. So he was in New York for these upfronts. So for him to come on Dave's show was a pretty big deal. Yeah. So that's uh, 1991 letter. Uh, Carson says one year, basically you've got, uh, and I'm retiring. Um, so we'll get back to that in a minute. But first we can kind of get into uh, the Leno Letterman relationship where they were friends for a long time. And it's funny because uh, often on this podcast, we'll reference uh, different people's influences, people they influenced, people they got influence from. Um and Letterman has influenced a ton of people. I mean, just in late night, pretty much everyone doing it right now has been uh, uh, influenced by Letterman in some way, particularly Conan. Obviously. Yeah, the clearest that's case the most, is Conan. That's the most obvious one. Um, but Letterman has a lot of influences. He was kind of one of the first guys to do these weird, wacky, like him and Andy Kaufman, I think, spawned a generation of um, just oddball comedy. Absurdist humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas Leno doesn't have that influence, but the one thing I've noticed just from comedians of that generation talking about Leno, like if you hear comedians talk about, he's a killer, he's the hardest working man in comedy, uh, like the way they talk about his comedy is with such, in, in such high esteem, like they respect Leno so much, guys like Seinfeld and Letterman's another one of those. So I almost think Leno's influences were his peers just from a work ethic perspective. Does that make sense? Like, I don't think there's a young guy where it's like, oh, clearly his act is influenced by Leno. But I think he uh, influenced a lot of guys that he was working with at the time. Yeah, Jay was so driven on his monologue. So this plagued him. Um, And NBC would have concerns if you read reviews in the 90s about The Tonight Show. I guess the, the thing was Jay would spend up until like the last minute working on his monologue. But he wouldn't do a lot of prep for guests. He didn't seem to give a shit about it. He said his and interviewing it, skills were terrible. Yeah, like especially early on. Like yeah. he just didn't seem to care. All he cared about was the monologue. And like you said, the hardest working guy. He would, you know, Tonight Show would be, you know, they tape Monday through Friday. And then he would go to Vegas and do and do and work there, do stand up stuff there. Well, literally at that, we were referencing the NBC upfronts. 
uh, Jay was there, but didn't see Carson because he'd already gotten on a flight to Indiana or something to do shows. Yeah, he would do stand up. Now, back, back then, in fairness to Jay, he was only doing Tonight Show once a week. Right. Uh, so he obviously had a, you know, had a bunch of time to kill. So why not keep doing stand up? And he loves doing stand up. But yeah, Jay famously didn't take any money from the Tonight Show. He banked all of that. Well, he took it, but he banked all of that money and he only spent money he made doing stand up. Yeah. So Gronk's another influence of him pretty much. Right. <laughs> um, uh, though, well, so that's the whole thing with you referenced uh, Jay's monologue. It's kind of the same thing that bothered me. I don't know if you listened to the Seinfeld episode I did mm -hmm. where I was very bothered yes. by his the way he talked about this joke writing. It's all about the jokes. It's all about the writing. And it's like, well, where is this litany of great jokes you've written, Jerry? Well, that was kind of the same thing where he puts so much focus into the monologue. It's like, I can't think of a monologue joke of fucking Jay's that I remember. Whereas like Conan, Letterman, Carson all have jokes where I'll go back and watch on YouTube now. They like still make me laugh. Leno doesn't have it's it seems all very kind of ham handed basic stuff. So I'm the the idea that he's this hard worker is a little bit lost on me. I'm sure it's true, but like it doesn't appear that way in the monologues. First, you're way too hard on Jerry. There's I I love Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. A little older than you, maybe that's why. I still have a real affinity for him. And I, I think his jokes are perfect. I love him too. That was my problem. Perfectly crafted. <laughs> I think he is funny. Yeah. Uh, but for Jay, um, they're very, Jay's jokes have always been very like, almost transactional. They're like in the moment. And then once it's gone, it's gone. Like it's just, it's, it's like, it's, it's such a quick process for him. So I think he's almost like the anti-Jerry in a way where he doesn't spend a lot of time crafting. It's more just like, I need to write these jokes. I need to write jokes. Just firing them out. Where Jerry's like, I need to make it the perfect joke. Right. And Jerry, Jerry, uh, Jay's much more about quantity than quality. And, and Letterman's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Well, there's, so I think the first clip we have is uh, Leno talking about Letterman's influence on him and vice versa, right? I mean, the both the movie and the book show it, but you could even see it in like interviews he's done and things like that. Letterman is not a very confident guy. And I think that's typical of a lot of comedians, but Letterman was like very hard on himself. And I do think Leno's confidence and stage presence uh, through their relationship did kind of rub off on him a little, or the, whether it rubbed off on him or not, at least the Letterman certainly admired it. I think. Oh, totally. I think admire is the perfect word. Like if you watch Leno on Letterman's show, um, I saw a little of this when I was younger, like in the late 80s, you'd see it, but you can go back and watch YouTubes of it now. You can look at Letterman's face while Jay is kind of, Jay was very animated. He was very loud, very boisterous. Uh, watch Jay, watch Dave watch Jay. And Dave is just like, wow, look at this guy do this stuff. It's pretty great. Right. Like you can tell Dave had a lot of respect and admiration for Jay at one time. Yeah. So they were peers that definitely respected each other, but they also were genuinely friends. Like, I don't know exactly how close they were, but um, when... Letterman was on uh, Mark Barron's podcast. He told a story about how um, he was bombing in uh, Denver one uh, one week I, or one weekend. I don't know. I couldn't tell if he was talking about they were doing shows from there or he was just doing stand up. Uh, but whatever it was, uh, it, word got back to uh, Los Angeles and Leno. Like Leno heard that Letterman was just eating his ass, <laughs> like just fucking bombing um, to the point where Leno called Letterman's wife. And was like, hey, if you don't mind, I want to pick Dave up from the airport. Uh, and she was like, yeah, fine. So he goes and picks Letterman up from the airport. And Letterman finds him. And he sees Jay just laughing his ass off, waiting to ask him about how bad he bombed. <laughs> like, they were genuine friends. Yeah. You know, and just so like a story like that. I didn't know if it was just Hollywood bullshit. Like, you know, he turned his back on his friend sort of a thing. But, like, they did seem like they were genuine friends. They came up together. And, uh, you know, Leno would do Letterman's show fairly often to the point yeah. where... Um, so Letterman, I guess they said is the fastest guy to have guest hosted the Tonight Show, meaning he was only on three times before he guest hosted. I was surprised Freddie Prince didn't beat him. I guess he was just on more in the three years he was doing stand up. But, um, uh, so Letterman evidently only did Carson three times and then guest hosted, whereas Leno, uh, did Carson four times and they said because he was kind of running out of material, there were diminishing returns each time. And then there was like an eight year stretch where Leno wasn't on at all. And during that time, Leno felt like his career fizzled out. And uh, in the movie, they referenced like I was doing strip clubs before I met Helen Kushnick and shit like that. Right. Um, and Letterman was one of the few guys having him on consistently and like giving him a platform and letting him grow in that way. Um, so not like they were friends and like Letterman helped him out a ton in, in Jay's sort of downtimes. 
Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's funny to think of Jay in the 80s. Like, Jay Leno was a Doritos pitch man. He was, right. uh, you know, any Doritos commercial in the late 80s had Jay Leno in it. And then, you know, you mentioned Jay had that long stretch where he wasn't on Tonight Show, but then he did, you know, got, obviously got the permanent guest host slot, I think in 87. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you if you weren't around then, you might look at him and be like, wow, it's so weird that Letterman got... Uh, Leno got the spot and not Letterman. Like, that's such a weird thing. But yeah. it really wasn't that weird in the time because, remember, the schedule back then was Jay did every Monday. So you were pretty used to seeing Jay Leno host a Tonight Show. Every single Monday, Jay mm-hmm. hosts a Tonight Show. Tuesday was the best of of Carson. And then Carson, I believe, did Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So, you know, it wasn't like it was strange as a viewer to see Jay at 1130 on NBC. It's also weird that Car- I've always found this odd that Carson was doing Fridays rather than Mondays or Tuesdays. Me too. I always think I always keep thinking I remembered it wrong because my brain I have it Fridays, but I I triple checked it and it looks like it was Mondays. So. Yeah, very weird. Um, so yeah, since we've referenced it, I'll go through the timeline of that a little bit. Where yeah, Joan Rivers was uh, Johnny's permanent uh, fill-in host, and then obviously their relationship fizzled out, which I'm sure we'll cover on another episode at some point. Um, but. It became Jay and Gary Shandling would kind of switch off with uh, fill-in roles. And then Gary Shandling got, I think it was, it's Gary Shandling, not the Larry. That was before Correct. the Larry Shandling show, right? So uh, Gary Shandling got that, and then Leno became the permanent guy. Meanwhile, uh, Letterman was, I mean, yeah, Letterman was doing uh, Late Night for 10 years. And they throw this in both, in, again, both in the book and the movie. Letterman was pissed that Jay got that spot as fill-in host. I don't understand. Is he suggesting that he would fill in for Carson on Mondays and someone else would fill in on his show? Yeah, I don't, Is that I, what he wanted? Like, I, I, I never got that because he has a show. It wouldn't just be one day. Like, you know, Letterman's in New York. And yeah. that's a big reason for this divide, too, is that it's another reason why Letterman was never really able to get too close to NBC because everyone at NBC was in Burbank. Yeah. And, yeah, the idea of Letterman being a fill-in host, I mean... I never remember anyone talking about that ever. That was never, you know, at least in the pop culture world, that was never brought up. Right, yeah. Letterman, Jared Carabas, a lot of the greats suffer these fates where they're not in the midst of things. So Gotta they be forgotten. in the thick of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, did, I always found that a little weird where like, just gr- I know at least by the time I was watching Late Night, it would have been weird if Conan was doing a different show once a week and then someone else was doing his show. It's like, why wouldn't he be on his show? I don't get it. It is weird. I will say though, back then, guest hosts were much more... It's much more common. Much more common, yeah. Yeah, like Kimmel's Kim, kind of brought it back He's done bit. it recently. Yeah. yeah. But no one's watching now, so who gives a shit? <laughs> right. But, I mean, yeah, but it is, and it's kind of an older, it's almost like the in baseball, you have the player manager. Yeah. Where, like, now it is, like, a player manager. But back in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't that uncommon. Right. I mean, it was rare, but. Um, oh, one, one other thing I wanted to bring up to you and see what you thought of it. I can't imagine, it's funny that these two guys ended up being the ones that were vying for The Tonight Show, and maybe... It's only because they've been talk show hosts my entire life and virtually nothing else. But I can't imagine them doing anything else, really. <laughs> Jay, he, he, Jay Leno did an action movie. Even stand up, frankly. Has he? Yes. <laughs> we'll have to see that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's hard to find. But yes, he did an action movie with Pat Morita, uh, but, where they're both cops. Is that before or after? Before. It's okay. In, it's yeah. During the Doritos time, the okay. late 80s. When he's finding his groove still. Yes. But yeah, so maybe it's because they became hosts. And I guess I could kind of see Leno as like maybe... Some kind of sitcom dad or something like that. He can't but, act, though. Yeah, I can't really see them as anything other than no. talk show hosts. And they're very different talk show hosts, but they just fit that role so well. Like, I can't see Letterman being the romantic lead in a, in a I mean, rom-com or something. You Letterman know? is so specific. He had a morning show back right. in the early 80s, and uh, it was critically beloved, but it, no one... Housewives back then in the eighties, it was home during the day. They didn't right. watch it, so he, they, didn't, they didn't like him at all. So uh, he really is only suited... For doing late night television talk show to the point to the point where they didn't even think all late night shows like that was the big sticking point with Letterman, and this I feel like is given too much like they analyze it a little too much. But there's a lot of talk uh, throughout this time. Can Letterman do eleven thirty? And that was the same with Conan. Will he adjust to eleven thirty? To the, so he was so specific that like being on an hour earlier, they didn't even think he could do. Yes, and that was that was the. I mean, we we heard that with Conan though. The same kind of thing. Remember, right, like, right, right. like, oh, Conan is so wacky. He's perfect for 1235 right. back then. But can he do 1135? And, right. pe- you know, a lot of people at NBC didn't think he could. Which is why the whole Conan Leno thing happened, I think, because it was only nine months and they panicked. They were like, we were wrong. He can't do 1130. Right. You know. Um, so where, where, have I missed anything so far, Craig? 
You are at Letterman. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Letterman left Leno's agent. Oh, yeah. So I didn't realize that Letterman was also represented by Helen Kushnick for a brief time early on. I didn't know that either. Um, and that's part of the reason he started to be very. Uh, he just felt the business was very sleazy. He did not did not like the uh, phoniness of Hollywood, I guess. And I mean, that's evident by his show. He became the guy that, you know, fucks with celebrities. He share called him an asshole. He made uh, J was a Jane Seymour that he made cry. Um, the weird thing he had with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, although it was pretty much Joaquin Phoenix's fault. But he became that guy that yeah. would like fuck with celebrities the same way right. Norm did. I, you can tell Norm got a lot of influence from Letterman, obviously. Um, but uh, so he became like he didn't like the idea of Hollywood. I think he eventually got a manager, but never really had an agent uh, until uh, Mike Ovitz. Right. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Yes. But um, let's play. Uh, what is it, the clip of Peter LaSalle talking about this a little bit? Talking about their attitudes. Yeah, let's hear that. Dave was always anti-NBC management and would say terrible things about NBC vice presidents on the air. And Dave was very uncooperative about doing charity events that NBC asked him to do. And Dave was his own guy who didn't like to play ball and could make trouble. And I as a friend, would try and steer him in the right direction, but I wasn't always successful. Uh, so he offended a lot of NBC brass. They thought he was just trouble. Jay, on the other hand, was the opposite. He would go, you know, do any he would go to each individual NBC affiliate and tell them how great he was going to be and how he would do promos for them and how he would cooperate and appear locally, whatever reason they had. Uh, and Jay is the guy who wants to please, as opposed to Dave, who's the guy who hates show business. So very, it, I think that's a common theme throughout entertainment of all kinds, where very few guys have both of those qualities, where they're able to, you know, kind of work the the suits and please the executives and all that, and also have extreme talent that makes them unique. So Letterman obviously had one of those and failed miserably at the other, and I think Leno was kind of the reverse. Like, obviously, he's a somewhat creative guy, but doesn't stand out as incredibly unique, but he was a people pleaser, and the executives liked him and things like that. Very rarely do guys that are super talented have both of those things, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's only so many hours in the day, too. So, like, where Dave would spend his extra time crafting jokes or thinking of bits. Yeah. You know, and creative stuff, and, and working with his writers and doing that stuff, where Jay when he wasn't doing his monologue, would call, like I said, call those affiliates. And, and those affiliates, he was smart about that because he knew those affiliates would always have his back. If he, if he helped them, he knew when times were rough for him, if the network was going to make a change, the affiliates would stand up for him and at least buy him some time. Yeah. And also, to be completely fair, it's not as if Letterman was solely thinking about bits. He was sort of a prickly sort to work with, it seemed like. Even, even some of the very funny stuff that fans enjoyed – um, like he would just humiliate executives on the air. <laughs> and it, oh, was, yeah? it was guys that felt like it was wrong because they didn't want to be on the air. And there's a story in the book where basically like they would send him a birthday gift and he would go on air and be like, look at this piece of shit that NBC sent me. And so the next year they would uh, not send him anything because they're like, we don't want to be humiliated. And he would bitch and moan like, can you believe how disrespectful they are? Right. So was, there was not a lot of pleasing that guy, which I think that mindset is part of what makes him so extremely talented and you know throughout the history of entertainment suits have not been able to say like all right we'll kind of appease that in people they get very they're people so they get offended by it you know which is understandable i guess but yeah i mean dave had that rebellious streak and then jay leno is the exact opposite like jay leno is safe and you know what you're going to get when you turn in turn on the tonight show right um but yeah, I mean, they, they couldn't be more. It's funny that they got along so well in the 80s. And Jay was a different comic back then, for sure. Yeah. Because they really, you couldn't find probably two more different human beings. Yeah, no. And Letterman, I didn't realize until um, 
I forget where I heard him talk. Oh, maybe when he was on with Norm or something like that, where he was talking about his drinking a few years ago. Um, but I, I, you know, think of Letterman as like a, an awkward nerd, like the, the image he's portrayed of himself. But like back in the day, he was uh, carousing with women. I like how uh, anyone that I look into, like before the 90s, it never says like they cheated on their wife. It's always they, they caroused. Caroused. Um, so like he was uh, cheating a lot back in the day. Well, I guess that continued into the yes, uh, <laughs> into the late show days but uh he was he was boozing a ton back then like he was kind of a party animal a little bit whereas uh leno didn't strike me as that as much although the book painted his relationship with his wife is very distant like i always thought of them as like a you know a very close married couple it doesn't seem like it was that way yeah it seems like there there is a distance there they never had kids um yeah i don't i don't th- yeah, it was Jay and Mavis, right? They, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic there, but they, hey, to their credit, in Hollywood, they've been together the whole time, so it's yeah. rare. Um, so now we'll get back into uh, the specifics of this war between Leno and Letterman. Uh, so I think it's like 87 or 88, um, <laughs> CBS decides we're going to throw our hat into the ring of this late night mix. Um, so Carson didn't have many competitors throughout his time. Like there was, uh, the Merv Griffin show, um, Dick Cavett. Those are daytime though. Um, for, for the, they're was more Dick known. Dick Cavett on during the day? Cavett was on during, he might've had a late night show as well, but he was mostly known for the day. I, thought, I assumed the interviews I've seen with him and like prior was uh, late night. I'm pretty sure it was all during the day. You might be right. Before my time. So I could be wrong. So, so even then you have even fewer competitors. Cause I think those are the only ones. Yeah. I mean, you had, uh. You, you'd have, like in the thick of the night, which is the Alan Thick show. Yes, that was on syndication. <laughs> that wasn't network. Right, but networks were terrified of Johnny. I mean, they, he would just he would just crush them. I yeah. mean, like it was the ratings were it was just a, insanely. You couldn't have a larger gap. It's almost like you know Boston Sports Radio. It's like ninety eight five and NEI. Yeah, it's like right. that big of a gap. Right to the point where like ABC would put Nightline on Nightline, right. which was uh, news. Uh, others, or I guess I was gonna say other stations, but there really only was one other one. Right. Uh, CBS would like play reruns of things and yep. shit like that. Like there was literally no competition for Carson. Um, and then you know you get to kind of the late eighties and companies start actually trying to throw some competitors at Johnny, but even that still took a while, even though they talked about his audience fading. Uh, the first one that CBS tried to throw at him was Pat Sajak. Pat Sajak. And you also had Fox had Joan Rivers at the same time. Fox had Joan. That did not last long. No, it did not. I think a lot because of Johnny. Like, Johnny wouldn't allow guests on, uh, things like that. Yeah, um, also Fox, it was, they just started. They were brand new, so they were not in every location. Yeah. They were only in a certain amount of uh, cities and, and, and municipalities. So, uh, yeah, but then Pat, 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 Sajak, Pat Sajak's show initially was 90 minutes. Oh, God. It seems like an extraordinarily amount of long time to spend with Pat Sajak. <laughs> this guy's giving you vowels for... <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you can fill an hour and a half. 90-minute <laughs> show. Uh, they, they quickly got off that, though, and made it an hour for the... Because it went for two seasons, I think. Yeah, so they said, I think, like, Pat Sajak's won in the ratings his first night. <laughs> and then oh, wow. was diminishing returns <laughs> compounded. Good for Pat. <laughs> After that. Johnny once. Yeah. Um, so Pat Sajak failed miserably and then, but CBS still wanted to get into the late night game. So that's when they started saying, Hey, what about Leno? Like it would just make sense. Then maybe some of Johnny's audience even comes over because they've been watching Leno once a week for however many years at that time. Yeah. Real quick though. CBS fired Pat Sajak Mm -hmm. and they replaced him literally with reruns. Like they, they didn't have a plan (laughs) for like two or three years in the early nineties. You had like. I, I forget what some of the CBS shows were, but you had like an hour long CBS drama like that you would just maybe seen on Tuesday right. night at 10. That's what they played at 1130. They had no options. Like they would, like I said, they literally just, Patsy was doing so bad. They figured they could do better with literally something they yeah. ran to. Here's the ago. episode of different strokes. You saw a couple hours right. ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, and at around the same time as when uh, Arsenio started with, maybe that was a couple of years later, 88, 89, something yeah, like that. Yeah, by that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and he was in syndication. Yeah. Um, so Arsenio started to take a piece of that young audience and then CBS said, maybe we can dig into Carson's audience with Leno. Uh, so they went to Helen Kushnick, who we should probably start getting into now. I referenced her a little earlier, but Helen Kushnick, if you watch the late shift movie, uh, play, she played very well by Kathy Bates and, uh, they make her out to be a real fucking monster. <laughs> and I assume the first time I saw the late shift, I'd assume that was kind of, you know, dramatic effect. And what I thought it was, was she's an agent doing her job. 
Um, and there was a lot of that. Like, I think on some level, she was probably a very good agent. Uh, but she was also seemed incredibly selfish and delusional in a lot of ways. Um, but being the good agent that she was, she did um, get an offer from CBS to start the um, competing with Johnny at 1130, essentially immediately. Like he would start on NBC or uh, CBS right away, and uh, be Carson's competition. Um, so Helen Kushnick went to NBC and said, "Hey, you better push Johnny out because we have an offer from CBS." And they said, "Are you really going to push Johnny out in his twenty? Like, at least wait till his thirtieth year?" <laughs> and she was like, "All right, we'll give him that, but that's it." And uh, they signed Jay to like a holding deal. Um, but Helen Kushnick would do things just to stay on her for a minute. She would do things like when she eventually became the executive producer of uh, um, The Tonight Show. And this is just an example of her ideas. And they touch on this in the movie a little bit. But she wanted like her image. So if you guys don't know, if you didn't watch Carson's last episode, (laughs) um, it's basically like a best of where he kind of goes over a lot of the highlights of the show. It's solely about the show. And Letterman did the same thing where they didn't have guests on. They wanted it to be about the show that they've done for 30 years there. It's just Johnny and a stool. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't have been more low key. Right. So Helen wanted this big production at the end where Johnny walks out of his studio, walks into Jay's office and hands him the mic and says, here you go, kid. <laughs> Meanwhile, Carson never wanted Leno to replace him. No. He wanted Letterman. <laughs> so the, that, the delusion of that for Helen to... Uh, think she could hold NBC over a barrel with that stuff. <laughs> it was very weird. And um, we have a clip from Jimmy Walker later, but uh, I guess Jimmy Walker dealt a lot with Helen Kushnick also. Um, and he said the movie toned her down a little bit. Like she was a <laughs> fucking nightmare, apparently. I'm sure she, I'm sure she was. Like, and I, I, I feel a little bit bad for Helen just because, just because you're a great agent doesn't mean you're a great executive producer. You should have a role in content. Like what she did well, she did very well, but she has ceiling obviously. And that personality type she had that did well, I said in one regard, was a complete disaster. When you have to be political, you're working with a lot of other people. You have 150 people and you consider the crew and everybody else and, and how much money the Tonight Show generates, like you're in charge of. And yeah. she wasn't equipped for that. No. And her... A big mistake was ultimately lying to Jay. So basically, Jay Leno, like we said, was the nice guy. He's a people pleaser. And uh, Helen Kushnick was kind of his muscle in uh, negotiations. Um, However, Leno was always very concerned, like even when the CBS offer came in that Helen leveraged with NBC, Jay was never interested in competing with Carson or competing with Letterman for the job. Like, he didn't want any of that because he had a lot of respect for both of those guys. Um, But Helen was the one that really, really pushed it. And um, where she ultimately fucked up was she planted a story in the New York Post that ran, and this probably contributed to Johnny um, wanting to get out as well, where she planted a story saying how Johnny's ratings were slipping and it's Leno's time to shine and all of that. Um, so Leno asked her about this cause everyone was telling Jay, you, you know, your agent is the one that planted this story in the post. And he's like, no, 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 she wouldn't do that. And so, uh, he called Johnny and said, just so you know, like I talked with Helen, no way she did this. And Johnny was like, okay, Jay, yeah, <laughs> like, sure. ne- never believed him for a second. <laughs> and it was funny because Carson's a guy that famously cuts people out of his life when they betray him. So in that story where Carson was like, hey, you know, watch out for people around you. It almost was like he didn't hate Jay, but he pitied him, which is worse in a way. (laughs) Like he was just like, "Okay, you fucking schmuck. Look at what your agent's doing to you. Right. Yeah. I I don't think it fooled Johnny for a second. Yeah. But uh, she got she got it over on Jay. Eventually, Jay found out. And that's when uh, he left her. And you could tell Jay has a lot of resentment for her because uh, I listened to his episode of Marin as well. And he talks about having an agent. He's like, nah, I don't have an agent anymore. I learned from that mistake. <laughs> like, he, he, I think he hated that entire period um, because he is a people pleaser. And I thought the book, uh, but I thought both the book and the movie, The Late Shift, were unfair to him kind of in different regards. Um, the book painted it as like there was some darkness that Jay never revealed. Like, we didn't see it on camera, but there's this darkness there. And the movie, kind of in the opposite direction, made him out to be this gigantic pussy. 
<laughs> like, and, and naive and kind of like a schmuck. Yeah, the movie made him out to be this quivering little bitch. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to upset anybody. In reality, I think he's a guy that respected Carson Letterman, wasn't into the fight, didn't want people to think he was a scumbag, which is, I think, a pretty natural natural thought. I mean, entertainers inherently are insecure, for sure. But I don't think in either direction that he's necessarily has these demons that they want you to make it believe he has, you know? I... Before the Conan stuff, I agreed with you. I'm like, yeah. ah, I'm sure he's somewhere in the middle, right, with Jay? But uh, since the Conan stuff, I, you know, I think we're starting to see the real Jay. Like, no, this guy just, this guy would stop at nothing to get what he wants. He just does it in, with a smile and kind of shrugging his shoulders while he does it. But he's, he's very purposeful. Yeah. Um, I think Jay does have a lot of those, those demons. And I think the book is actually more accurate than I thought when I first read it, if that makes any sense. Well, it's funny you say that because I actually felt the opposite where when I, at the time, because I was a big Conan guy growing up, like Conan used to be re- replayed on like Saturday mornings on Comedy Central when I was like nine years old. Yeah. So that's when I started watching him. Um, so when the Conan Jay stuff went down, I was completely team Conan. Then when you look back at it, I was kind of like, what was Jay supposed to do? Like NBC is the one that didn't want Conan. Is Jay supposed to say, no, 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 come on, guys, don't offer it to me? Because maybe they would have given it to someone else, if not Jay. You know, like Jay Leno was the, wasn't the was the only person that could host The Tonight Show. Jay going and doing that 10 o'clock show sank Conan, though. Conan never had a lead in because Jay forced his hand to do that 10 o'clock show. Right. But, well, Jay, but my point with that would be Jay, Conan forced Jay out to begin with. Conan never said, hey... Jay's a legend. Let's give him some leeway. You know what I mean? Like, Conan didn't have that respect for Jay. Like, I'm not going to push this guy out. That's where that five-year deal came right. from. So why should why does Leno owe Conan anything? Then fight. Or, or then, then do it like uh, not to fight like a man. And go yeah. then go to another network at 11:30 and go at him one on one to go in when you know in his own house and yeah. and fuck his wife basically <laughs> yeah. like you know yeah. like that's that's a whole different game like that's that's really scummy shitty thing shitty thing to do yeah like, and that you know what that might be where leno gets this kind of reputation where letterman will say complimentary things of jay and he doesn't really get in the mud too much but like during that conan thing his monologue was littered with fuck nbc oh, fuck yeah. jay and not in uh, irreparable ways, but ways where you could tell Dave was like, fuck them, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, I guess there's a little bit of that where it, it maybe it comes off as phony Jay's act. But I thought Leno had a great quote on, um, I forget what interview I saw him on, but they were asking him about Letterman, and uh, Leno basically said, hey, listen, uh, when, you, when it comes to that stuff, Letterman was the, you know, anti-corporate guy, but if you're going to take the money from NBC, you're corporate. Whether you want to believe it or not, you're taking money from a giant corporation. So you can paint me as the bad guy for, you know, committing to it and being, you know, friendly with the affiliates and the executives and things like that. But that Jay looked at it as that's just me doing my job, whereas you ignoring that is you doing being bad at your job. And you Jay's know? absolutely right. Like yeah. Dave got those birthday gifts and makes fun of him, like you said, on air. But he's cashing their fucking checks. Mm-hmm. Like, that doesn't stop him. So it's like, yeah. all, all right. Like, I mean, yeah, you're not a company man, but... To Jay's point, though, you know, if you put those in the bank, you are. Yeah. And I mean, I would say that with any perform a fucking uh, Chappelle now, if you look at him, like he's this anti-establishment guy, but is Netflix not a giant corporation that he's getting money from? You know, Chappelle has the ability to put stuff out himself, but he'd rather get the get the safe dollars. And I don't blame them for that either. Of course. Yeah. That's why, like, the idea of selling out is not entirely accurate. Like the idea of getting paid for your art, like for what you're doing is a little silly to paint that as selling out, you know? Oh, I agree. I mean, if your art is that good where you can be that successful, I say go for it. But if you're going to play that rebellious card, every once in a while, people will bring up the fact that you are, you know, getting giant checks from GE. Yeah. So that's where I think Leno, Leno was almost more authentic than Letterman in that way. You know, yeah, like he I wasn't, agree. and I don't way. think Leno was as much playing a character. He was this people pleaser. And I think he was pretty upfront with that. Moment. He always was. Yeah. Um, what have I missed so far, Craig? Where are we? We are at uh, Henry Bushkin, Alfred Letterman, The Tonight Show. I didn't skip anything in the process? No. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this Henry Bushkin thing I thought was interesting. And Are you familiar with Henry Bushkin at all? I don't know if I am. Uh, Henry Bushkin was Carson's longtime lawyer and ran, essentially ran Carson's company towards the end. Okay. Um, so Henry Bushkin wrote a book. That's how probably I Probably... 
10, 15 years ago, something yep. like that. Uh, and I found this to be incredibly scummy. <laughs> the idea, and maybe yeah, you, some you, personal stuff in that book. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe I just probably don't know the uh, ins and outs of this. But like, Bushkin was Carson's lawyer and knew, had a lot of privileged information. And Carson dies, and Henry Bushkin writes a tell-all. Yeah. Does confidentiality die with the person? <laughs> like, I don't are know. You, at I, least not morally. Like, are you supposed to just tell every secret secret that the person has? I, I don't know that. I do know one thing. is Johnny was incredibly private, and yeah. there's no way in hell he'd want some of this stuff about him, like, you know, jumping out of apartment windows to avoid getting caught for cheap, sleeping out with somebody else's wife. <laughs> right. Like, there's something like I said. It's not just Tonight Show stuff. It's like how Johnny drank a lot and got into bar fights and stuff. Like I, I can't imagine he would want that stuff out there. Yeah. So Bushkin to me, struck me as a guy, uh, I've heard him interviewed and I find him a fascinating interview subject. Cause he does have a lot of stories. I wonder how many of those are embellished at all because there's no one alive now right. to have corrected. Them. But, um, so I find him to be an interesting guy. However, a uh, bit of a sleaze ball. And I think this story would kind of, uh, back that up. So, um, before, NBC had made any sort of decision about The Tonight Show's future. Uh, Henry Bushkin called in uh, Letterman for like a private meeting and said, basically, uh, we want to offer you The Tonight Show. Johnny owns The Tonight Show now. We want to make you the host and we want to set it up so that um, you're the host. Maybe Johnny comes back for a few specials or um, guest appearances or whatever. But essentially, it's going to be your show. Um, and Letterman was like, okay, well, why isn't Johnny here? Like, he felt it was all right. very shady. It was a little weird. Well, he's like, why am I talking to Johnny's lawyer about this? Um, and so he called Peter LaSalle. Have I properly set up who Peter LaSalle is, by the way? I don't way? think so. The executive producer of uh, The Tonight Show forever. He was uh, Johnny's right-hand man and then became Letterman's right-hand man, basically, um, when Letterman got The Late Show. So uh, Letterman called Peter LaSalle about this and was like, does this seem right to you? And Peter LaSalle was basically like, Henry Bushkin has operated possibly outside of Johnny's wishes. He's like, I don't know if that's true, but that's my belief. Um, so Letterman read this correctly, where um, that's ultimately what severed their relationship. Like I watched... Uh, uh, the clip wasn't great, but I uh, so I didn't include it. But uh, Bushkin was on with Artie Lang uh, oh. when the book came out. Okay, and Artie was asking him about that. He's like, "What ended things with you and Johnny?" And Bushkin's like, "Eh, we had creative differences, you know, as people do when they work together." Blah blah blah. What really happened is Johnny found out things like this that P uh, that uh, Bushkin was going behind his back, and Johnny fucking exploded because <laughs> he does not take well to that. Johnny wanted to control everything. So when he found out Henry was doing this type of stuff, he was not a big fan. No, I, I shouldn't blame him. Yeah. Um, what's next, Craig? NBC's goal was to keep both guys. Oh, yeah. So this was really weird. So their goal is to keep both guys um, to the point where they wanted to, and this happened a lot with the Conan thing, a lot of this type right. of discussion. They wanted to basically combine the shows mm -hmm. And uh, 30 Rock actually did a hilarious like parody of that whole situation. Um, but essentially what they tried to do the first time with Jay and Dave, and it's amazing they didn't learn from this with Conan, but um, or when Conan happened, I right. should say. But um, they wanted to make... The Tonight Show would have been done. The Tonight Show would have been gone. And 11.30 to 1.30 in the morning would have transformed into NBC late night. Um which would have been Jay doing a show and then saying, all right, Dave, take a take off. It's all yours. Right. So that's the weirdness of TV. Kind of like I was talking about with the 1135 thing. They think these little tiny, they look at these, scrutinize these little details, I think, too much to the point where they're like, well, what if Letterman was on at 1230, but we called it the same show? I'm like, how does that possibly, what would make you think that would work? Yeah, why would that appease Dave at all? Like, it, the whole thing doesn't make any sense. It's so bizarre. It was just as bizarre as when, it, like I said, later on, NBC yeah. wanted to have the Tonight Show start at 12.05, so yeah. it was like the Tomorrow Show <laughs> right? Um, to appease Conan. But those guys, I mean, I think when you're in that, when you're a suit at NBC, yeah. your whole life is 
got to make it work, got to make it work, got to make it work. And sometimes you're just putting out solutions without ever really thinking how realistic they can be, because that's your job. Your job is trying to make everybody as happy as possible not to rock the boat. And I just think you're in that mode 24 seven. And then you just come up with some fucking batshit ideas. Yeah. And Warren Littlefield's another guy who's an NBC executive that like took a lot of shit during this whole thing. But it is tough in that position where like they wanted Jay, even though like creatively I admire Letterman a hell of a lot more. Like he was certainly a fan favorite, but ultimately now that we know what happened in history, like Warren Littlefield and NBC were right to pick Jay. Absolutely. Um, well, that's actually another conversation I wanted to have with you. Do you think, so let's say none, none of this mess happened. Okay. Carson says I'm retiring in a year. Uh, NBC says, we're going with Letterman. Letterman's going to host The Tonight Show. Jay, you can have Late Night or you can go off to CBS. Right. And Jay hosts The Late Show on CBS. Right. Do you think that Letterman is number one for all those years? Because if you don't know, for those of you at home, uh, essentially Letterman was number one for like 60 weeks. So a little over a year, Letterman dominated. And then Leno came surging back and pretty much didn't let go for the duration of his tenure there. So there's a few things there. So Letterman had a huge advantage. And in this, in your hypothetical, Jay would have that advantage. So CBS had the Winter Olympics in 1994. If you remember, that's the Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan one. Okay. So like a lot of eyeballs were on CBS. Dave Letterman was smart and even sent his mom to the Olympics, if you remember, and she was doing interviews with her. He was being, for someone that was so anti-establishment, he was doing a lot of synergy with CBS, especially up top. And with the Olympics, it makes a lot of sense. Like it it was a huge ratings grabber, especially back then. Also, CBS is... uh, primetime schedule was much more robust. Now, NBC was going through a, a sea change. Tartikoff had just left for Paramount. He had run NBC, Family Ties, Cosby Show. Um, I'm forgetting a million great NBC shows. Cheers. Cheers. Like, you know, go through the list. So NBC was a powerhouse, Night Court, and all that was Tartikoff. And then when Tartikoff left and the little field took over, it took little field a little while to kind of get his, his right. sea legs. And NBC struggled for a tiny bit. Now they weren't, you know, you still had Cheers. You still had kind of Seinfeld emerging, but there was no Friends. There was no ER. None of those big time NBC shows that dominated the 90s were there yet. And when they came in, yes, you had the Hugh Grant stuff. We'll get in that in a second. But like, you know, that's when NBC took off. But CBS was a stronger network at that time than NBC was. Right. So you had better lead-ins. And I think that makes a huge difference. Uh so I, I, I think, I don't know, Jay to CBS feels so weird. It's hard to even imagine that. Yeah. But for a lot of Americans, yeah. I think Jay Leno is the perfect Tonight Show host where he doesn't rock the boat and people don't want to be challenged. It's funny though, for whatever reason, maybe it must've just been the programming. Cause when I was a kid, I would always watch the office and 30 rock and parks and rec and mm-hmm. shit like that. Um, so like I thought of NBC as cooler than CBS. So in my mind, Leno would have fit CBS better. Like I think of Leno as kind of stuffy, like old people watch Leno right. and Letterman was cool and he would have fit with uh, community and weird shows like that. So I almost picture Letterman as an NBC guy. And so I guess when Leno started taking over in the ratings, their rationale was the opposite of what you said, <laughs> because by then Seinfeld had kind of hit a groove. Um, then you had friends taking off an ER. Um, so they basically set a Frasier, eventually yep. on Tuesdays. So they were essentially saying what you just said about NBC, where like, Dave, well, what can you do? We have Becker and they have <laughs> Seinfeld, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, CBS, I mean, like I said, it wasn't like, I think, if I remember correctly, I think it was pretty close. I want to say ABC was probably the number one network at that time because you had Home Improvement, Roseanne. Roseanne, yeah. Um, but uh, of those two networks, it, it was much closer than it would be later on that decade when NBC would completely take over. And that really helped Jay. Right. So well, who would have had the better? It's hard to imagine. I don't I don't know. I'm guessing things probably would have worked out the way they did. More or less. Leno still wouldn't have been number one, you think? I don't know. I, it's hard. I mean, he, he became so popular. He just beat the shit out of Dave for like 15 straight years. Because I wonder, a lot of the toiling that went on back and forth about like, do I take this show? Do I go to CBS? Do I go into syndication? Whatever. Is because of the weight that The Tonight Show carried. Like the title, the the brand, the and it franchise, did. the it Tonight Show. Did. So that makes me wonder, like, if Letterman, does it not really matter who's host of those two? Because they're so close. Like, it wasn't like Leno blew Letterman out of the water. So is the Tonight, is, is the, the show, the Tonight Show, what's making that difference? Or was it just that Jay appealed more to the Midwest? Or the whatever? other element of this, too, is that you know, once Jay gets the job, Dave is still doing late night. So for 13 months, right. it was Jay Leno followed 17, by Dave. I think it was like a year and a half. 
Uh, I, thought, I think it was 13 months. But well, then you had the reruns. Oh, so you okay. had 13 yeah, yeah, months of new yeah, shows, yeah. which it's hard to remember, like, you know, or it's hard to even think about it. But like, yeah, you, uh, you turn on NBC, you had Jay Leno followed by David Letterman for over a year. And then NBC had the choice at that point. Once June 25th was over, they could either go with reruns of Letterman or they could do what CBS did and put in like random broad like programming. Mm-hmm. They could have moved Bob Costas up. There was rumors of that because right. uh, he, he was on after Dave. They had all these kind of different things, but they, NBC chose stupidly, in my opinion, to run Letterman reruns. Yeah. And kept Letterman in the zeitgeist for another like two, three months until Letterman built his studio. Um, so that helped keep Jay alive. And it also helped keep the interest going where if Jay just took the CBS show like that. I don't know if it would have been as exciting. Um, you reminded me of something there with the Casas thing. I guess when it started being rumored that Letterman was going to take over, because like you know, long before uh, Jay was in the mix, it was like you said, it was always in the r- rumors. Sure. Is Carson going to retire? So it started to become is is Letterman the heir apparent? And I guess a couple of the names that were thrown out there at the time were Burt Reynolds and Richard Dawson. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. know how serious those rumors are, but what a disaster those would have been. <laughs> those would have been a complete mess. I mean, Tom Snyder was rumored a lot. Yeah. He ended up taking the spot after Jay, but he had a later he had a late night show on back in the 70s and 80s as well. He ended up being the guy that had the Craig Kilborn slash. He was on after Letterman, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he had a show back in the 70s and 80s too. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of rumors Snyder might get the Tonight Show job, but that wouldn't have worked. I mean, if you watch those shows, he's very chill. Serious. interview. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he's not like a true comedian, so that would have been an odd fit, too. But Bob Costas had that 1.30 to 2 a.m. slot um, for oh, 10, 12 years. A very long time. It was just an interview show. Yeah. And there, so there were a lot. They thought of a lot of different things, I guess, to their credit. Because even when uh, when Jay had the holding deal for Carson's job, they also did that, I guess, with Dennis Miller, um, who was on Weekend Update at the time. And, like... I. Most people probably know that Seinfeld was originally um, given like a late night deal, like the Seinfeld Chronicles was going to be a late night late show night slash variety because deal. they saw him as more of a host. They didn't yeah. think he'd carry a sitcom. So they were also thinking of Jerry as which I could actually kind of see like oh, now me too. We know now we see Jerry as like sort of a prickly character. But like I think he could have played the the role of ho- you know a friendly host. I think well. so too. The only he doesn't like he doesn't seem to like doing political or topical humor. Right. So I think the monologues would have been kind of grating for him after a while. Yeah. But maybe he's such a smart guy. I think he would have figured it out. And I think his interview. I think he would have been good. Yeah. So I, I know we keep bouncing around, but we keep bringing things up that mention that <laughs> trigger right. my memory. But um, one of the things when Letterman did go to CBS was um, I guess he didn't talk about OJ at all for a while. And that was the biggest story in the country, obviously. Uh, biggest story maybe ever. <laughs> um, and there's a clip of uh, Howard on Letterman where he's just busting Letterman's balls. Like, why aren't you talking about OJ? And Letterman was like, well, I don't find homicide particularly funny. <laughs> like, I guess it was just an issue Letterman didn't want to touch. And they say that Leno was making OJ jokes every night. And he was able to do it in a way that didn't seem crass. He was kind of mocking the circus around the yes, OJ stuff. That's fair. Um, so that hurt Letterman a little bit. And then you mentioned the Hugh Grant thing. I've always wondered about that. Were you you were old enough to have been oh, like watching the time? I remember shows. where I was and I watched it. Yeah. So how big a star was Hugh Grant? Was he like a Ryan Gosling? What would you compare him to? Uh, well, he was newer. So he was okay. newer. Back to the the OJ thing though. Yeah. Jay had the dancing Edos. Okay. Which were oh, yeah. which were a bunch of like he had like twenty five people dressed as Lance Edo and they would just dance and that was a regular segment like a two minute bit where you'd have all these people dressed like Lance Edo dancing and you're right it was a lot of the circus stuff but I think Dave also just got bored of the OJ stuff maybe that too. like I mean I can't emphasize enough like if you're younger like OJ it was everywhere it's all encompassing it's all people talked about it's all you thought about for like a long period of time and Jay just it was easy humor and he just leaned Watch right into trope. it. Um, but I do think there's an element of people looking for that. Like as much like we could say now, people are exhausted with Trump. But if you make fucking Trump jokes for whatever reason, people seem to enjoy it. It's a know? pretty. That's actually a pretty fair comp. Yeah. Um, so, but as far as Hugh Grant, yeah. So Hugh Grant was pretty new to the American landscape. He had just done four weddings and a funeral, which got a Best Picture nomination, and that came out in '94. So now we're like on his like second or third film. Like, so he's like been a movie star for maybe three movies. Okay. Um, so a newer heartthrob kind of a Yes, guy. that's fair. But also someone who came across as incredibly innocent and incredibly um, almost boyish in the way he conducted himself on interviews. And um, he just became like, 
I'll say America's darling. That's not really. He wasn't that big of a star, but kind of that role where like, oh, this guy can. This guy would never do anything wrong. Okay, so it was more like the. Uh, it was the shock. Yeah, the, the attitude of him rather than the level of fame. Or he's anything. with Elizabeth Hurley. You're know, like the just the the details of the story just seem so counter to what we thought Hugh Grant was. That's what made it so shocking. He was caught with a prostitute, right? Did we say that? I believe her name is Divine Brown, if I remember the name correctly. But yes, he was caught with a prostitute um, and he was dating Elizabeth Hurley at the time. And people were just, people's minds exploded. Yeah. So I'm glad you remember it because I wanted to ask you this. I've gone back and watched that interview and it didn't strike me as particularly outstanding. Everyone points to that as the moment Leno took over Mm -hmm. and like just took the crown from Letterman and ran with it. Was it at the time, like, were people like, holy shit, I can't believe Leno was asking these things? Or is it just the fact that he had him on and for whatever reason, America never turned it off? The latter. So okay. uh, people, Hugh Grant for a while, for a few days, uh, I think was canceling media stuff. He went to Jay first. That was on purpose. He was promoting a movie. I forget which movie. Uh, and he had a bunch of stuff lined up and he canceled like the three before Jay. So his first landing spot would be Jay because I think he thought it was going to be a really soft landing sure. spot, which it kind of was if you watched the interview. And, um, but people were like, literally like, oh my God, I can't wait to watch tonight's show and see Hugh Grant address this. Cause it was like a, for like two weeks, it was a me, it was like the number one news story. Uh, it was, it was huge. And he went on and then Jay asking, you know, what the hell were you thinking? It was a great question to ask because that's what we were all, everyone at home was saying that. And once Jay said that it triggered something, a lot of people it was like, oh, he's one of us. Like Dave's the weirdo, brilliant guy in New York, but this Jay, I know he's asking questions that I want to ask. And okay. I think it really changed, it turned the tides. And then a lot of people, and then I said NBC then started to rise. And then once you get in a groove late night, you know, especially the, like, the flyover states, like people are going to kind of fall into their regular just habits. Yeah, and then it compounded with all the stuff we talked about with uh, scheduling, Seinfeld and Friends and all that by that time. Um, but I like when I watched that interview now, and obviously I watched it, you know, 10, 15 years after it happened, but I was always like, Letterman would have done such a better job with this. <laughs> why is the, why does he get the hype that it does? But yeah, so I guess that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's why, that it was more of like a moment in time that people were captivated by. It really was. Um, so now it's, I'm sure we're going to go back a little bit because we skipped a, Letterman already has the late show. <laughs> <laughs> so how did he get there, Craig? What did, what did we miss? Uh, we have the video for the two hour block. We have what? The two of them staying on the same channel. We There was a clip for that segment. The two-hour block uh, where they were going to have Jay and Letterman have... All right, let's see. That. I don't remember what this clip is, so this should be interesting. Let's see. I said to Dave... Well, Sally. Okay. If you're going to follow Jay Leno at 1230 when Jay gets the Tonight Show, you're going to hate yourself. You're going to be miserable. You're going to think, why am I following Jay Leno when I... For 12 years, hosted the 12:30 show, and I did a good show. My reward should be the Tonight Show. Well, it doesn't. Life doesn't always work that way. If you're a good boy and you behave, you don't always get rewarded for it because somebody else is going to do it their way. Uh, That's a good way to put it um, by Peter LaSalle because there was a lot of. I got the feeling, and this is true of Conan as well, where it was almost like, well, they were owed the Tonight Show because they were doing the show behind it as if it was like a farm system and you just call the next guy up. But, you know, to NBC's, to defend NBC, like, it is a business. And if they think Leno is going to, you know, bring in, like we said, older people or people in the Midwest or whatever, younger people, whatever demographic they're going for, then that's who they should choose. It shouldn't be like... Yeah, well, Letterman's been here for 10 years, but there is there seemed to be a feeling from them like, well, they owe me this. Of course. I mean, Dave, I'll get into Ovid's in a second, but Dave didn't have an agent. Right. Like, how do you expect to get to Tonight Show and not have an agent? It's so stupid. Dave's such a smart guy, but that's so stupid. Like, you have to play ball, especially if you're in New York. Even more reason to have an agent. You need someone in LA to kind of be your eyes and ears. Like, the fact that Jay, like Dave was so anti-establishment to the point of where it hurt him, it's just, it's so foolish. Well, ironically, Jay doesn't have an agent now. I guess he doesn't probably doesn't need, need it now. as much. Yeah. Although he might he might have used some help during the whole Conan thing, but yeah, that's right. what got him in trouble. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned Mike Ovitz. He eventually was uh, the head of Disney, right? Is that's that right. what he left for? Correct. But uh, he was, like, one of the biggest agents out there. Um and basically, what happened there was uh, Letterman didn't have an agent forever. And Peter LaSalle, again, 
This is pretty much the Peter LaSalle show. He did everything for Letterman. Letterman would have been a huge been figure a in mess. All this stuff. Great guy. <laughs> um, but Peter LaSalle basically told him, like, you need someone to represent you. Um, and he, I think I, I think I can get you Mike Ovitz. And Letterman was like, all right, well, that's interesting because that's a pretty big name. Um, so they got him Mike Ovitz. And the way Ovitz was able to kind of play NBC was pretty brilliant because at least, you know, the way the movie would portray it and probably kind of what made Mike Ovitz a more respected agent than Helen Kushnick, let's say, is that he didn't do a lot different from what Helen Kushnick did. He just did it in a much classier, smoother way where you didn't even notice he was kind of fucking with you. Yeah, I mean, Mike Ovitz was, at the time, the most powerful agent in Hollywood, and CAA was a major firm. That's, yeah. where, that's where he worked. And uh, and he he knew all the right contacts. He also knew how to speak to people. He knew how to make deals. That's what he did his whole life. Where Helen... Kushnick at times almost was just like abrasive yeah. in your face. Yeah. And he did. So Ovitz, the way he played it was Letterman wasn't allowed to talk to these networks. And Ovitz was basically like, all right, we won't talk to them. They'll talk to us. They'll pitch themselves to us. And then it's legal and NBC can't do anything about it. So pretty brilliant guy. It seemed like, um, what's next? Gregory, uh, Leno listened through the wall to take notes. Oh, so this is one of the great, <laughs> one of the great moments in entertainment history. So basically, um, some of the NBC brass is in uh, Boca and they got other guys like Warren Littlefield on the phone and they basically wanted to collaborate and say, what are we going to do about this late night thing? So we're now at the point where Letterman is still technically under contract while uh, Jay is hosting The Tonight Show. And The Tonight Show is not going perfectly. Like, I don't think it was a disaster, but they had a lot to deal with with Helen Kushnick. They hated her. Right. Um, and they ended up pushing her out, uh, but still like some damage was done and it gave them enough time to think like, well, was Jay the right guy? And then they started thinking about Letterman. So they all convened to have this, uh, big meeting where they're going to hash it all out and make a decision. Um, so Warren Littlefield was in his office in LA, I think, right? Is where that happened. I'm yeah, I don't Assuming. know if it was Littlefield was in the office, but right, one of the guys in NBC was in his office. I thought it, I thought it was Littlefield, because right. that's who Jay called after to so Jay, That's who Jay called after, yeah. right. <laughs> um, so maybe I just assumed it was yeah. Littlefield. But uh, whoever's office was uh, in LA, Jay snuck up there to like, in a, everyone's always said a closet, which is a much funnier image. I think he was actually like in an adjoining office or something, where he could hear through the wall um, the meeting that they were having. And he could hear verbatim everything everyone was saying, and he was taking notes on all of it. And that gave him the ability to figure out which executives liked him, which executives didn't, what they liked about him, that, that some thought the monologue was too long, that some thought his interviews sucked, all that kind of stuff. It gave Jay all this knowledge, which is pretty brilliant. And I like people have shit on Jay for that, and you know it makes him look like kind of a weasel. I do kind of admire it in a way, though, because like, why? If you're there, why the fuck not? You know, it's such a bizarre story. I've always wondered who leaked that. Like, how did who knew that he was there besides him? Right. That's why I, I almost didn't believe this story. But the story's been out there for so long, and Jay's yeah. never really refuted it. So I no, it, and the way War, the way Warren Littlefield is told it is basically like. He was, it wasn't like paraphrasing. Like Jay knew Jay direct, knew all the details, direct right. quotes, which, so maybe that's just how it came. They assume that he was in the room. And maybe Jay he, came clean to Warren Littlefield eventually. He's like, hey, look, gotta tell you, this you know, is how it went down. Like, uh, yeah. Because it is such a wild, bizarre story. Yeah. Now, my question through that, though, was like, how much did that really help him? Because it doesn't change what they think of either guy. And they still push Helen out. So I don't think it really makes a huge difference. Right. So as much as it was like a big win for Jay, I guess, and in the, I guess both both the movie and the book, they kind of portray it as Jay reacting like, oh, you motherfuckers. Like, I got my eye on you. Yeah. But like, I always wondered, well, what did that really do? I guess the only, the only thing it may have done is it made the break between Jay and Helen to be more, to happen faster. Because Jay knew how serious NBC was. Like, NBC is seriously considering going different directions. True, that's a good point. And, and maybe that was the, the, what Jay needed, the wake-up call Jay needed to finally part with Helen. Yeah. Um, what's next, Craig? Uh, let's see. Helen painted a story that NBC wanted Carson out. Oh, planted a story. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, at this point, we've gone, like, all over the place. Yeah, I know. Trying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure that out. Um feel like I've uh, derailed your podcast. How long have here. we done, by the way? 
Uh, we're it's been hour, a long one. Hour five. All right, so we got a couple of clips left. Let's. Uh, what's the first clip that we have left? Uh, Jimmy Walker. Yeah, let's hear from that because he he had a little insight into uh, some of this just from being around, basically, and dealing with the legs of Helen Kushnick. JJ Walker, by the way, we've played a couple. I wonder if he's just bullshitting because every episode I do, there's a clip of JJ. If it happened in the seventies, JJ Walker's like, "Well, I have a little story about that." <laughs> yeah, this that clip I watched it and uh, it seemed to be total bullshit. Okay, let's hear it first. <laughs> Stinks. David Letterman jumps in and says, "Hey." How about Jay Leno? Johnny Carson said, absolutely, positively out of the question. He stinks. I hate him. I don't like his looks. Get the hell out of here. So they're futzing around, trying to get a host. They're bringing in people. David Letterman flies out to the left coast because he's not a left coast guy. Flies out to the coast, goes to the mansion at the beach, kisses the ring, says, please, give Jay Leno a shot. <laughs> this does sound like bullshit now that Jay I'm hearing Leno. it again. <laughs> Jay's a great comic. Jay's very good. Acting. Very, very good. He did very well. They were mulling it over. David Letterman flies out again and says, you saw what he can do. Please give him a shot. He gets the show. Helen's managing Jay at the time. Jay is euphoric because you'll hear Jay say this all the time. It's the best job in the world. Do joke, get money, get check, this and that. So he had been doing uh, Letterman three times a month, flying back. So Dave calls Jay and says, hey, man, congratulations. I'm glad you got that spot. He says, you should fly out and announce it on our show that you're going to be the host the next Monday. So they say, okay. Helen says, fuck David Letterman. We're bigger than him. We don't need that shit. Okay, well, that's probably bullshit. Now, <laughs> and I got to tell you, I, I just wanted to believe in it. Like, but, <laughs> I, I've, I've read a few books of this. I know you have two. I, I, I remember, I, you know. I haven't heard a story. And why would Letterman fly out twice to be like, hire Jay Leno? <laughs> I was reading like trade papers and stuff, and I watched a little more of that clip too. And it's like, like I never once saw Jimmy Walker involved in any of this stuff. Like, he makes it sound like he was working with Helen to get this whole agency started. Yeah. I mean, maybe some of it's true, but it, a lot of it just rang. This was, this was late in my uh, 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 researching. So maybe <laughs> I, I would, he could have told me anything at the time. I would have believed. <laughs> but it, does, it did remind me. The one thing that clip did do is uh, remind me that um, a big thing with Helen Kushnick was basically telling Carson to go fuck himself multiple on multiple occasions. And one was on um, Leno's first Tonight Show. Before the show, uh, Bob Wright, I think, was yep, the head of NBC, right. called, uh, called Helen Kushnick and said, like, so what do you got prepared to kind of, you know, pay homage to Johnny? And she was like, um, nothing. <laughs> and he was like, I, I really appreciate it if you did. And she was like, this is Jay's show now. Johnny can go fuck himself. So there was uh, a constant feeling of, uh, and Johnny ended up not mentioning Carson at all, which he ended up uh, correctly, as Bob Wright said, getting. You mean Jay didn't mention Johnny? I'm sorry, did I say? What but did I the say? other way is true too. Johnny never mentioned Jay. Yes, so correct. You got to defend Jay as much as yeah. I, I'm not a Leno big Leno fan. Uh, you got to defend Jay a little bit there, and, and Helen like. Johnny did Jay dirty the last couple of weeks. That's true. Should have had him on. Like, there's a way to do that. And I thought I've thought this forever. It's so weird. Let uh, Carson's last show to me, and by that I mean the last show with guests, is so bizarre. Was Robin Williams like an integral part of the Tonight Show? No, but he was known at that time as like the guest because he was like wild okay. and frantic. Like he would have been like a it's an exciting guest. I always thought it should have been Letterman or Leno or. Uh, Rickles or someone that meant something to the Tonight Show. Robin Williams seemed like such, and Bette Midler seemed like such odd choices to me. Yeah, he liked that song, uh, or she had a song for him, and he liked yeah, her, yeah, he yeah. liked her singing a lot. Uh, but no, there was a lot of talk even then of like it was weird that he didn't have Jay on. Yeah, uh, it, but it, even it if you want to, if if like Jay, so Jay wasn't Johnny's choice. So like if he doesn't want to acknowledge him, right. whatever, why not have uh, Rickles? Or I'm trying to think of who the night a comedian that he had on consistently. That is like kind of tethered to the Tonight Show or Johnny himself rather than Robin Williams. It just seems like such a weird choice. To it's me. odd. But remember, too, that whole month, like yeah. it was all farewell to Johnny. So yeah. like every True. episode was like his favorite this or his favorite that. So like there was a lot. Everyone had a chance that he loved, had a chance to walk, to, to, you know, sit in that chair next to him and talk to him. So True. Um, so, yeah, Jay didn't say anything. But you're right. It was kind of uh, maybe deserved. Well, why does Jay owe that to Johnny if he doesn't want it the other way? Around? Right. Um 
What's the? Let's play another clip, Craig. What do we have left? At the two you sent me this morning in Marin. Uh, let's do the Marin one first. Yeah. Dave doesn't like network suits. Yeah. And one of the network guys just asked one of the talent corners, my two college-age kids are in town. They want tickets for the show. And yeah. Latimer Heard said, no, no, they're not coming in. And it's, it's our show. No, no, I don't want, no. And I remember one of the, when they gave me the show, one, yeah. of the, one of the guys said, I wasn't going to go through 20 years of that. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, I think right. he probably would have gotten it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, but but don't, don't forget, it's sort of, it's a double-edged show because yeah. they had a hit show, a huge hit show. Yeah. You had Johnny, who was seen as the old school, on his way out. David was the bright, shining light at 1230. Yeah. Well, why not bring a new guy in to take over from Johnny and then keep the bright light shining at 1230? Uh-huh. I mean, I think Dave was somewhat a victim of his own success uh-huh. because the show was so big and perfect in that time spot yeah. and they weren't sure if that would work at 11.30. They had a guy guest hosting who was getting really good ratings and doing well. Mm-hmm. All right, why don't we just do this? And that's what they did. I mean, you know, people would get mad at me and I, what, what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to turn it down? Was I supposed to go, no. <laughs> Right. I mean, it wasn't, you know, there's this sort of thing that somehow I snuck in at the last minute and stole the ball here. I was guest hosting for five years. The only guest host on the show. Yeah. That's where I agree with Jay. That's why I threw that clip in there. Like, where I agree with him is there is some sentiment like he stole The Tonight Show. And they stole it back from Conan as if he never deserved any of it. But, like, he worked his ass off for that and had success. Like, he was number one forever. And you hear guest hosts, but I can't that's enough. It was every single Monday. Yeah, he so was a, he, almost like a co. Like he was doing the show. Yeah, <laughs> like fifty-two times a year. Twenty-five percent of the new episodes you got tonight show were Jay Leno ones, right. like from eighty-seven to ninety-two. It was not strange all the time. Like when it happened, people were like, "Oh, I wish Letterman got it." Sure, but no one was like, like when Conan got the job, you're like, "Who the fuck is Conan O'Brien?" Yeah. When Jay Leno got it, it was like, "Oh no, I don't agree with that. I understand." Yeah. Um. So the last couple of clips we have here. Are, by the way, I meant to mention this a minute ago. Uh, we talked about Carson's last guest. Uh, I think it was the last week before um, Jay started The Tonight Show. Leno was on Letterman. And I got all excited when I found that clip. I was like, oh, shit. I thought it was going to be like a big fucking they hash things out. Leno's doing like bits on there. They barely graze upon the subject of him taking over for Carson. And then Letterman just goes, uh, all right, Jay, the big night is uh, May 25th or whatever it was. Yeah. And that was it. Like, they didn't really talk about it. It was very weird. That is strange. As big of a feud as this was, and even in, like, I wanted to pull clips from uh, the press conference that Dave had when he officially went to CBS. And even there, he was very, you know, diplomatic. So as much as this feud and everyone says, like, Letterman and Leno hate each other, publicly... It was very rarely even like spoken about other than the jabs Letterman would take in his monologue and things like that's that. That's why everyone has it wrong. The late night wars aren't Dave versus Jay. Right. The late night wars are the networks versus Dave, NBC especially versus Dave and Jay. Yes. Like that was the battle. It's all against the network, NBC in this case. That That's who you're really fighting. Now the Jay and Conan thing, that was a personal battle. Right. Uh, but this one... It never really got super ugly with them, like, especially, even you know, in public or it seemed like they both just had issues with NBC. No, which is also weird that it seems like Letterman still holds this grudge and maybe Jay does, too. But it seems like Letterman much more so because they don't speak anymore. Um, they did that Super Bowl commercial with yep. Oprah where it was a funny, you know, they're both reaching for the chips. It's fun. <laughs> um, but like when Letterman got his Netflix show I was, or on the last week of uh, The Late Show. Right. I was like, oh, perfect. to will have Leno on. Yes. Never has done it. It's very weird to me that like, do they, they must, Letterman must still harbor a grudge because why wouldn't you have patched things up? Publicly, anyways. Yeah, it seemed like, obviously, they got, you know, they're at different networks, they were competing, but the, even in the early 90s, it didn't seem, in mid-90s, it didn't seem that frosty, but as time went on, it did get frostier between them. And yeah. I think a lot of it had to do, too, with Jake kicked Dave's ass True. for a long time. True. And Dave spent a lot of his energy trying to catch 
J and failing. And I think that creates some nasty feelings that maybe didn't exist when they both got the job. Sure. And let, like we were talking about earlier, like would Letterman be doing better with the Tonight Show name behind him? I'm sure he looked at it I'm that sure way his, too. Yeah. Whereas like if I, that motherfucker, if, if I, I was only, on that set, yes. then I would be doing the numbers he is. Right. And I think if Jay had enough time, I don't care if he's on CBS or NBC, he would have eventually risen to the top. But maybe Dave's right. If he didn't give, have that boost of the Tonight Show, maybe it never would have happened. Yeah. So this is a clip of basically what I was looking for in the last episode. Kick Robin Williams the fuck out of there and have a little more of this. This is a famous clip between uh, Carson and Letterman. After the announcement was made, obviously, that uh, Jay was taken over. Just start off with a, uh, with, with a question here. Just, uh, <laughs> just how pissed off are you? <laughs> I've never asked that question in many years. Here. Johnny, let me, let me give you a little piece of advice. <laughs> you, you keep using language like that, <laughs> and you're going to find yourself out of a job. <laughs> I love old clips like that just because you get to see, like, half of that huge reaction from the crowd is like, Johnny said pissed on yeah. television. <laughs> it's funny how different things are now where they're like, he said kind of a naughty word. Um, but yeah, good, good job by Carson. Oh, even there. And this is why, uh, in the Jackie Gleason episode we did, um, we talked about, um, him doing a show like Jackie Gleason did this game show that fucking bombed. And the next week he came out in that time slot and instead of doing the game show, did a breakdown of how miserable the show was right. and what a, what a disaster it was. Um, so I, I was like in awe of that because I was like at that time in the fifties, that Never happened. Like, breaking down the fourth wall. That never happened. Um, but then when I watch clips like that, I'm like, even in the 90s, they weren't really getting into it. Whereas now, if a public feud like this was happening and Letterman went on Carson, you couldn't have... That would be the only thing you'd talk about. Not, yeah, but you would wouldn't it, lightly though, raise it. Would still be can Imagine if Fallon... Like, if Kimmel went on Fallon, I think it would still be kind of candy-coated. Or if they if they had some feud or something. You know what I mean? Like, I think it depends on where your landing spot is. I think a lot of this corporate, you know, there's so much money in these late-night talk shows. They are so corporatized. Yeah, you're right. I guess the reason I'm putting a different spin on it is because I think both of the guys in that clip, Carson and Letterman, are different than that. Like, Fallon and Kimmel, I wouldn't expect it from, necessarily. Like, they could goof around and do silly nonsense. Carson and Letterman were such bitter guys that I'm surprised they didn't spend 10 minutes ripping NBC, you know? And yeah, they did it in their own way a little bit, but it wasn't a little bit, particularly direct. But to Jay's point, we talked about earlier, at the end of the day, they're still company men. Right. And they were uh, Letterman was still working for NBC at the time. Right. Um, so, yeah, you're right. But I, I wish I wanted there to be a little more there. Um, so lastly, our last clip here, we'll finish on um, a clip that I found interesting, both because I think there's some truth in it, and I think there's an example of something that pissed Dave off about Jay, um, maybe particularly in the later years, like you said, as, we, as he grew more bitter. Um, but let's hear Jay first. Uh, just so people know, I, I read some uh, articles and some things, and, and maybe some people perceived uh, Dave to be the bad guy or something, and, and it's not really the case. I mean, this is sort of a job everybody wants, and I've been in here, and it wasn't a matter of both of us auditioning for the job. It was a matter of, well, do we fire Jay and keep David, or what do we do? And they chose to keep us on, which I'm glad. David will be going to uh, CBS. But all through it, Dave has been nothing but a, uh, a gentleman, never anything sleazy or underhanded, and quite the contrary. We both had, uh, I think, quite a few laughs over watching NBC attempt to weasel around these uh, two situations. So we wish him the best of luck at uh, CBS. I'm sure he will be a formidable competitor that will certainly keep us on our toes here. And uh, God bless him and his staff and good luck. Okay. So that's about as direct as Jay. Like for Jay, that's a very direct shot at the company. Say so they're weaseling around it and is. everything. Um, so good job by him for mentioning it. However, in there, I think is some of what pisses. Dave and other people off about Jay um, because uh, when the Conan thing happened, uh, Leno also put out a statement saying, don't blame Conan for this, even though uh, everyone was on Conan's side. Right. Uh, and Letterman in his monologue was like, oh, that's nice of Jay. Don't bl Hey, guys, 
Don't blame Conan for this when no one was doing that. For losing his job. Yeah, and so in there you hear him say, like, don't blame Dave for this. And I think there's a part of Letterman that looked at shit like that, like, you motherfucker. Like, look at him as if whether Jay intends it to be, is being phony or not. I think that's what pisses some people off about Jay. Uh, one thing we forgot to hit was um, Arsenio was... Uh, I guess Arsenio was like pals with Leno back in the day. They used to play video games together or something. Um, but then when it was announced that played Jay... video games? Like, Atari, I assume? <laughs> That's, Jay said we played video games. We used to, our, we used to play video something. games. I don't Nintendo. Know. <laughs> I can't. Super like, Nintendo. It was pretty early still. That's pretty early. Though. It was out in the 80s. It was, it was 86 when Nintendo came out, but I just can't imagine like 1986 like the according Duck to, Hunt. According to Jay, they were cutting <laughs> edge. <Great. laughs> <laughs> Duck Hunt's a great game. Though. Well, it, it is. That might be, might be Leno bullshitting based on the story I'm about to tell. Because he portrayed it that like him and Arsenio were friends. And then when Leno got the Tonight Show, Arsenio did an interview where he basically said, I'm not friends with Jay Leno. He's a phony and I'm going to kick his ass when he gets into the Tonight Show. Yep. Um, and so I think there is an element of like, uh, and the way the way it was said was that like Arsenio would describe it as, yeah, yeah, they used to be acquaintances that saw each other at the comedy store or whatever. Whereas Jay took that as friendship. So I think there's an insecurity to Jay that makes him such a people pleaser, but that also I can actually kind of relate to this where like you think you're being genuinely nice and other people are like, you fucking phony. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like think you're being self-involved when you don't intend that way. It's just you're so insecure that things are coming out in unintended manners. I think Jay is a lot of that and it kind of plagued him throughout his career. And you can tell, like, even hearing that, like, Jay obviously is uncomfortable giving that message. Completely. Um, so yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's just, Jay's just kind of awkwardness with dealing with something's head on like that. Yeah. So that pretty much uh, wraps up. We left out the biggest name, the late night wars. So you, you had uh, the same, you know, roughly the same time period Dave was at CBS. Yeah. Chevy Chase. Of course, yes. Chevy Chase started for, at Fox. For a small time, you had people were like, oh, who's going to win? Yeah. Jay, Dave, or Chevy? <laughs> I didn't realize it was discussed like that. Not really. I mean, it was, it was on Fox, but people thought that uh, Chevy would certainly have an audience. Well, they said that when they looked at Chevy Chase and talked about his popularity, whether it was versus Arsenio, Dave, and Jay, or even like other big names at the time that they could have put in that would seem maybe more suited for talk shows, Chevy like beat them all. Like they thought Chevy was going to be like, they're like, oh, perfect. Well, we mentioned the rumors for Johnny taking Johnny's spot. Che Chevy was like the number one guy for a long time. Really? In the, in the 80s, yeah. He was a huge, I mean, you forget how big a star Chevy was. And maybe this is only because I know Chevy Chase now as the guy that was calling Donald Glover the N-word on right, Community. Right. But um, I look at him <laughs> as such a fucking miserable personality. That would he have been able to keep up the facade of being a friendly host five nights a week? Well, on we, a we know the show? answer to that, Mike. Well, yeah, I guess that's no, true. No, because his show lasted five weeks. Yeah. So was it, did you, did he seem very phony? Did you ever watch it? Yeah, he seemed really uncomfortable, awkward, didn't want to be there. Yeah. I, you, you could tell, you could see, starting to see him, be, like the cracks of, like the miserable was starting to show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, it was a disaster from day one. Like the second the first episode came out, you're like, oh no, it's. Like, it was only on like six months, right? Or maybe even It was on like five weeks. Five weeks? I really? I think it was on, it was on for an incredibly short amount of time. Wow. I didn't, I didn't double check that before I came back, but I'm pretty sure it was on for an amazingly short amount of time. And, um. I think that might be less than the Magic Hour. <laughs> Magic Hour went for a whole season. <laughs> yeah, right. I used to watch it religiously. Uh, but everyone said at the time though, Chevy had the advantage, just not the advantage, but had an advantage where his show was starting at 11. So he's going to get a heads up on Jay and Dave. But after the very first episode came out, everyone's like, no, no, this is simply a Jay versus <laughs> no Dave good. battle. Yeah. It's weird that Fox was never able to crack into late night, even now. Like um, when Jay left, when Conan took over for Jay, the talk was maybe Lena will go to Fox. Then when Lena or when Conan got kicked out, the talk was Conan will go to Fox. I know. And Fox has always been in the mix and never figured out a way to put on a late night show, it's very weird. The affiliates won't move off that hour. They want that hour for late for the late local news. So that pushes you to eleven, which is still a heads up. But uh, I think the for a long time, Conan, especially Dave, was worried that they were go, be going up against other networks' late local news. And at right. the time, those brought in huge ratings. I don't know if we would change now though. It's very strange that they were so set on the local news even in the last. 10 years I know. Well, or it's been yeah now i mean late night is also dying so maybe yeah. they looked at it as like well who cares it's a flip of the coin but i mean we're i know i think you're talking about it with kirk but like uh J dave was getting 
around what four million a night when he had the twelve thirty slot. Yeah. On yeah, C- yeah. on NBC. So he says he's getting roughly four million. And now, I mean, Seth Myers couldn't touch a million. Oh, my God. It's not even like they were talking about Letterman doing a four point one rating or something like that. Yeah, at twelve thirty. Now they do literally in the zeros. Like yeah. They do less than one right. for a rating. It's unbelievable. Yeah, Seth Myers doesn't crack a one. No one's watching them. I mean, it's wild. It's, it's so yeah, I mean the whole I mean the sad thing is the whole this will never happen again, what we're no. talking about. I mean, you know, maybe you'll do the Conan versus I'll do Jay Conan, yeah, at some point. Discussion. But like even then though, it didn't have the same oomph. Like this captivated the nation. Like people were it, it was a huge story. It was a giant story for like two years. I mean, they made a, a movie. Story. They made a movie and wrote a book about it. it yeah, yeah, but it was, like, but it was constantly yeah. spoken about. Like, oh, yeah, who's yeah, gonna? Yeah. And uh, people were like genuinely excited. I remember that there was a TV guide uh, that when J- when Dave started, and it was Dave, Jay, Arsenio, Chevy Chase. Uh, like, it had all of their faces all on the cover. People were like really excited. Who's gonna win the late night war? Right. <laughs> yeah, and it was. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff that we even missed, but. Um, let us know about that on uh, Twitter, I guess. I don't know. Um, Chris, thank you for coming on. This is easily our longest episode, I think, right? Yeah, by like by like at least 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so excellent work. Uh, hopefully hopefully, I didn't piss you off too much. There it is. I was wondering when that was happening. I don't know how I didn't <laughs> think to ask for that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I should have said is, we're here to talk about the late night wars. Right, Johnny? <laughs> yeah, that's right, Mike. <laughs> See, I was on the other side. I was like, how long until he does it? And so this was surprising. Well, I hope if you listened all the way to the end, you got a real nice treat. <laughs> what a bonus. <laughs> um, so, yes, you can hear, uh, obviously, both of us on the Kirk Minahan show, but you can also hear Chris on uh, at a theater near me. That's right. So go download that wherever you get podcasts. Um, go to patreon.com slash blind Mike, where you can get episodes of this program a week early. Um, as well as all kinds of other bonus content. And, uh, you know, make sure you subscribe and do all the stuff that helps the show on Apple and Spotify and YouTube and everywhere else you get podcasts. Uh, Craig, obviously the host of Very Good Show. Hey. So go listen to that. Excellent work today, Craig. I rarely say that. Good job. Thank you. This was, your, this was your best episode yet. You didn't get in the way easily. <laughs> Not even close. I could have. I could have stopped. I don't know the topic that well, so I didn't. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, enjoy, everybody. We'll talk to you next time on Why Are You Laughing.